And I'm glad we're talking about singing because that's our, our theme for this Advent sermon series. We're talking about songs of the Savior over the next four weeks. Uh, four songs that we find in the opening chapters in the Gospel of Luke. And when you read the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, the first few chapters actually come across like a musical because every time the grace of God comes to someone, they can't help but sing. They start singing because God's grace has come. You know, I saw Frozen 2 the other day, and um, yes, I did, and... and (laughs) And every three minutes, you know, uh, they were singing because goodness came to them or something like that. And I thought, oh, that's the gospel of Luke here. God encounters his people and they cannot help but to sing. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to focus on songs of the Savior. And this week, we're going to focus on the song of Mary, which is the first song we find in the gospel of Luke, the song of Mary. And so we're in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 46. This is known as Mary's song, and when we read it here, uh, Mary sang these words here, and I I can only imagine what the rhythm sounded like, what the cadence sounded like, but uh, hear are these words to this song. It says, and Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. And then after the song, he says, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we look to your word today, may you speak to us through this beautiful song, and may Mary's song be our song today. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. One of the things that I love about the Advent season is the songs and the carols that we hear. Every time we go into the mall, every time we drive our car, we hear the Advent songs, the Christmas songs that remind us that there is a new season that we are in. And when I hear the songs, I just can't get enough of them. I know the songs are coming. I know which songs are coming. And year in and year out, I I receive them and I sing them as if I heard them for the first time. Songs like Joy to the World, songs like O Holy Night, Angels We Have Heard on High, All I want for Christmas is you. I I mean, Mariah Carey. Um, uh, Michael Bublé's Christmas album. I just can't get enough of the songs. And there's something about songs that when they have powerful lyrics to it, it it does something inside of us. And that's just the nature of, of, of singing. When we sing words and declare words, it somehow carries a a power, a strength inside of us, which is why St. Augustine said that whoever sings, prays twice. Whoever sings, prays twice. And that's good enough reason for us to sing and lift our voices together and worship on Sunday morning. Because if you want to double your prayers, start singing. That's a good deal. Just start singing. We double our prayers. Whoever sings, whoever sings, prays twice. And so that's just the nature of singing. And today when we look at this, this song of Mary, we, we see a song that's powerful. And it's, it's really the most powerful Advent song. And it's sung by a 14-year-old poor girl uh, that no one really knows about, but God has his eyes on. If there was a Jerusalem idol, if there was a Jerusalem's Got Talent... Uh, Mary's song would win the prize because her song is filled with 
theological richness. It's filled with emotional passion. And Mary sings for us on this Sunday. Now, most of us Protestants have a hard time with Mary. There is something about Mary, yes, and we have a hard time with Mary. We don't know exactly what to do with Mary. Some of us are a bit skeptical, fearful of Mary. Some come from Catholic traditions, and now you're in a kind of non-Catholic tradition, and, and you just don't know what to do with Mary. And so evangelical, Pentecostal, charismatics, we're a little skeptical of Mary. And so the, the question is not, what do we do with Mary? The question is, what does God do with Mary? What did God do with Mary? Because God showcases Mary, and Mary has words for us today. Mary has something for us to learn. Mary has something to say. And so as we look at Luke uh, 1, 46 through 40, 56, Mary sings the song. But I want to tell you why she sings. I want to rehearse the story to you because her words flow from a particular place. In the beginning of Luke, Mary is engaged to be married to a good man named Joseph. And I imagine that she is excited to get married. I imagine that she's created a website for her wedding. I imagine that she's registered at Williams-Sonoma and Bed Bath and Beyond, and she's shopping for her wedding dress at King David's Bridal. And um, yeah, King David's Bridal. And some of you know what I'm talking about. OK. Uh, she updates her status on Facebook and counting down the days when she is going to be married. And, and as she's thinking about her life, as she is thinking about the family to be, God interrupts her. Has God ever interrupted you? You had your timeline and your agenda and your goals and your dreams and your plan. And, and then God interrupts you. God interrupts Mary and invites her to consider a different kind of life with a different kind of future, which would change the course of human history. The angel Gabriel comes and says, Mary, God has favored you and the Messiah is about to come and God wants to, you to partner with him to bring out the Messiah into this world. And, and Mary says, how will this be? And the angel says, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you will be pregnant and you will give birth to the Messiah. I assure you, when she woke up that morning, she was not anticipating that. I assure you, when she woke up, she was not thinking about changing the course of human history. And yet, here God is interrupting her plans. Now, for Mary to say yes to this, and she says, let it be unto me according to your word, this is not something that was easy for her to do. This is not an easy decision, because this decision is going to carry with it lots of problems for her. In the United States, there's uh, over a million teenage girls who get pregnant every year uh, out of wedlock, as we would say it. And in these cases, there's scandal that takes place. Uh, increasingly so, the scandal that takes place. But, but the scandal that we experience here is nothing like the scandal that Mary would experience. Because forever, for someone to be engaged as she was to Joseph and then found to be, found to be pregnant was more than just uh, a mistake. It, it, it's something that would get her stoned to death. And so by Mary saying yes is her risking her life. Risking her reputation. Could you imagine the conversation that she had with her parents after this encounter with God? She knocks on her parents' bedroom door and says, Mom, Dad, I need to tell you something. I'm pregnant. Imagine the shock on their face. And she says, don't worry about it. It's God's baby, you know. <laughs> Could you imagine? Imagine you're Joseph. And she says, Joseph, I have something to tell you. I'm pregnant. But don't worry, God did it. I, I mean, could you imagine if you're Joseph? 
Could you imagine if you're, this does not work in my neighborhood, I assure you. This does not work in my family. And yet Mary says, this is what happened. This is why Joseph needed a dream. He needed a revelation. He was about to kill somebody. He needed a revelation. And so here Mary is, risking her future, risking her life. And yet she says, yes. I imagine that because of this news, she was ridiculed. She was marginalized. I imagine the people in the neighborhood talking about her, gossiping about her on social media, talking about her all over the place, and yet Mary endures it. And there comes a point where Mary actually leaves her hometown to be with her relative Elizabeth. We don't know exactly why she left, but I imagine she needed some support. She needed someone to be with her. And when she gets to Elizabeth, she hears that Elizabeth is pregnant as well. Now, this is strange here. Because Elizabeth is up in age. And here we have, it's a, it's, a, it's a delightful scene where Mary encounters Elizabeth. And as one person said it, one woman is old and has no children. The other is young and has no husband. And both are pregnant. And so Mary encounters Elizabeth. And, and when Elizabeth sees Mary, the baby, John the Baptist, inside Elizabeth's womb, jumps for joy. It's almost as if, finally, I found someone who understands what God is doing in my life. And, and Elizabeth says, God's favor is on you, Mary. She affirms and confirms God's word to her. And out of the joy of this encounter, Mary starts to sing. And I love that Mary sings right on the spot. Mary doesn't say, I can't wait to go to the 1030 service at New Life to sing. No, she starts singing right there. Why? Because when goodness comes your way, you can't help but sing. Have you ever been driving in the car and you realize the goodness of Jesus towards you and you just start singing? No one's there. You're singing loud and off pitch, but no one's there to hear it. But there's so much joy bubbling inside of you. You just got to sing. You ever been in the shower and all of a sudden a Bible verse comes to mind? You think about the goodness of Jesus and you start singing. I know I'm not the only one. I start singing. That's what happens when I'm excited. I sing. This is why when Thanksgiving came and I saw the plate, I started singing. I always sing, and I sing, oh, this is the day. I start singing, this is. I start singing all kinds of songs, new songs, old songs. Why? Because when goodness comes your way, the proper response is to sing. And Mary starts to sing. And when she sings her song, there are really a couple of themes to her song. And I want to share two of the themes that comes up in her song. That should mark our lives, that God wants to mark our lives by. The first part of her song is this. Mary's song is a song of mercy. It's a song of mercy. When she, when she starts singing, she, she, she bursts forth with exuberance, joy. And her words are Hebrew poetry. And in Hebrew poetry, if you say one thing, you say it again using different words to emphasize your ideas. And so she says in verse 46, my soul glorifies the Lord. And then she searches for a, another way to say it. She says, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She continues to sing about the goodness of God, but then she ran, Mary starts focusing on God's mercy. And she starts parking here over and over again. She picks up God's mercy, God's mercy, God's mercy. In verse 50, she says, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. In verse 54, she says, he has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. And the word mercy that comes up over and over again in the Greek language is the word eleos. Elios. Let me hear you say Elios together. Elios. It's a good word. It's mercy. Elios. Mercy. Mercy. When we think about the word mercy, there are a lot of images that come to mind. Mercy. When we see children playing in baseball leagues, Little League Baseball, and one team is destroying the other team, we have the mercy rule. 
where the league says, we don't want to see these poor little kids continue to get beaten up inning after inning. Stop the game. Mercy. If you ever played a game of mercy with someone where you interlock your fingers with another person and then you bring it down this way here and you see who's stronger than the other, and then you just, ah, uh, and then, and then, and what do you say when it gets to, ah, oh, mercy, 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 mercy. Now, in that case here, that's what we think about mercy. But I want to tell you that, that that's a very limited way of understanding mercy because mercy and this occasion here is about providing relief for someone who's in pain. That's one way of understanding mercy. But eleos goes a little deeper than that. It goes further than that. And I would say that it's important to mention that because we often believe that God is the one who's grabbing our hands and hurting us. And when we say mercy, we're saying, God, you're responsible for my pain. Have mercy. Have mercy on me. And this is what happens when when we see what's happening in the world, tragedy in the world, suffering in the world. For some of us, we say, Lord, have mercy. And we say it in a way as if God is responsible for the pain in the world. And we say, Lord, have mercy. But that's not the case. God's not the one who's bringing the suffering. God's not the one who's bringing the pain. Often it's, it's, the, it's the sin in the world, our bad decisions often that brings the pain and, 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 and the suffering that we experience. But God is the one who offers eleos. God is the one who offers compassion to us in our pain. Mercy to us in our pain. It's a wonderful word. Compassion. Mercy. And it also speaks to God's loyalty towards his people. That when his people are not loyal to God, God remains loyal to his people. This is why Elios is the New Testament version of my favorite Old Testament word, chesed. Now let me hear you say Elios again. Elios. Now chesed, I mean, it only works when you spit on someone. And so, and so it's, it's the cha. It's, 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 say it with me. Chesed. One more time. Ches- if you didn't spit in the person, in front, you didn't do it right. You didn't do it right, okay? But these are the two words. They're rich words. They're powerful words. And so when Mary sings about the mercy of God, she's not just singing about God uh, relieving her of pain. As, as one theologian said, these two words uh, really speak to this, this range of meaning here. Go to that next slide for me. When we talk about Elios and Chesed, we're talking about the consistent, ever faithful, relentless, constantly pursuing, lavish, extravagant, unrestrained, furious love of God. Isn't that wonderful? When God has mercy on us, God is offering to us consistent, ever faithful, relentless, constantly pursuing, lavish, extravagant, unrestrained, furious love. And so Mary celebrates God's eleos, celebrates God's chesed, and says, God, you are a God of mercy. You provide compassion for your people. And we need to sing a song of mercy because our lives desperately need it. When you think about your own inconsistency, when you think about the ways that you are uh, irritable and temperamental, and the ways that you and I are inconsistent, aren't you glad for God's mercy? The Bible says his, his mercies are new every single morning, and yet our lives are to not just receive God's mercy, Our lives are to express God's mercy. And we need this song because our world is often not marked by mercy. Our world is marked by meanness. Meanness. Go on social media and you'll see meanness. Drive a little bit on the street here and you'll see meanness. Take the subway and you'll see meanness. In a culture of meanness, God wants us to receive and offer mercy. And yet, this is very hard for us. I'm reminded, not too long ago, I was driving on the LIE, and as I'm driving, I, 
I, I lost track of where I was. I was probably singing. And as I'm driving, I realized that my exit is coming up. And I better get there, but I look to the side and see there's a lot of traffic on that lane of people getting off in the same exit. And so I realized, oh, no, I should have gotten off way before and get on the line here. But now I'm going to have to cut someone off to get into this lane. Now, um, uh, some of you, you do that purposefully. Uh, uh, and and <laughs> me too. Uh, and so... Um, but, but, but this time, it wasn't purposeful. This time, I, I, I missed, ah, I missed it. And so I looked to the person uh, looking for mercy, looking for mercy to, to let me in, let me in. And, and I looked to the side, and the person's going, nope, 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 nope. So I go to the next person, come on, let me in, nope, nope. And they're about to hit the car in front of them because uh, they don't want me to get in there. And then, nope. Nope. And then finally, I look at one person. Come on, let me in, man. Come on, let me in. And the person simply goes, go ahead. Just, just, go, just go on. And I said, oh, thank you. And I get in. I lower my window. I just, I wave at them. Thank you so much. I received mercy. And then about um, 10 seconds later, someone tries to do the same to me. <laughs> and I said, nope, 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 nope. I'm such a sinner. Pray for me. I, 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 who do you think you are? What are you doing here? But aren't you glad we talk about having God's mercy that, that when you ask God for mercy, God doesn't say, nope, nope, nope. He, he lets us in. He lets us in. That's why we celebrate Jesus. Because in him, he lets us in. Mercy. Eleos. Chesed. God's compassion for us. And out of receiving this mercy, God calls us to extend this mercy as well. I think about a story of an a old priest. He was over 80 years old and he was nearly blind and he was sought out by many people. Many folks went to him for advice and one day they asked him a question. They said, if you could do your priesthood over again, do you have any regrets? Would you do something differently? And this man was filled with integrity, and no one thought that he would have any regrets about anything. And yet this man said, I have a major regret, and this is what it is. Follow on the screen. He says, if I had my priesthood to do over again, I would be easier on people the next time. I wouldn't be so stingy with God's mercy with the sacraments, with forgiveness. I fear I've been too hard on people. They have pain enough without me and the church laying further burdens on them. I should have risked God's mercy more. In a world of meanness, Mary sings about mercy. God's mercy that comes to us. God's grace that comes to us. God is a God of mercy. And so we sing with Mary these words as we think about this coming week and when you fail to do God's will and when you get irritable and scream at the kids or when you feel a certain way about a person and, and say some choice words or when you do something, think about Mary's song. Think about the mercy of God that's available to you. And anytime someone comes against you or someone hurts you, think about Mary's song as difficult as it might be to offer mercy to the people around us. Mary sings about mercy. But Mary has another part of her song that I want to focus on as well, and then we'll take communion together. Mary sings about mercy. And then Mary has another part of the song, which is justice. Mary's song is a song of mercy, and Mary's song is a song of justice. In verse 51, it says these words, He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. When Mary sings, she's saying, God's justice is coming. 
And God's justice, when we think about God's justice, we think in terms of retribution. We think in terms of the courtroom. But when we talk about justice, biblically speaking, we're talking about God make, taking everything that's wrong with the world and making it right. And in God's kingdom, God has a way of flipping the script and saying whatever works for the world in the kingdom of God is now being set upside down, put on its head. And so the least are now the greatest. The last are now the first. In a world that overlooks the poor, in the world that overlooks the weak, God says, when I am ruling and reigning in the world, the value system of the world is turned upside down. That's justice. God taking what's wrong and making it right. God taking what's broken and healing it and bringing it to wholeness. And Mary sings about justice. God, when you come, you're going to take everything that's wrong and you're going to make it right. And that's essentially what she sings about. When I was in high school, I broke my wrist twice. I broke my wrist as a ninth grader and then broke my wrist again as a 10th grader playing basketball and football in Brooklyn. And in both times, my wrist was mangled. It was a, a terrible sight to see. And then I went to the doctor, and the doctor took an x-ray and, and then set it back in place in this excruciating moment, but he set it back in place. That's what God does. God looks at our world, and it's mangled. It's broken. But in God's hands, when Jesus comes, he, he takes that which is broken, and he sets it in its right place. And, and Mary says, Lord, only you can do this. Advent is a time where we wait for God to make Things right. So it's a season of longing. It's a season of anticipation, of waiting, of expectation. When you look at your life, when you look at the world, what's going to make it right? Not politicians. They're not going to make it right. Not, not another job. That's not going to make it right. No human person, no human strength will make the world right. Only God can make the world right. So Mary says, Lord, make it right. It's a song of justice. It's a song of God making all things new. And so what's the good news of Mary's song? I, I want to summarize it. In two phrases here, Mary's song of mercy and Mary's song of justice. When you look at Mary's song, uh, uh, Mary's song, it reminds us of two things. The first thing it reminds us is this, that there is no sin so deep that God's mercy doesn't go deeper. Oh, that's good. That's good news. There is no sin so deep that God's mercy doesn't even go deeper. Some of you come into church today and you wonder, will God have mercy on me? If, if, if people just knew what I've done, the decisions that I've made, the people that I've hurt, does God have mercy for me? And the good news of Advent is there is no sin so deep that God's mercy does not go deeper then. This is good news. Some of you come in here with condemnation and shame. And the good news of Advent is God has come. God is coming in the person of Jesus and offers mercy that goes deeper than our sin. But the other thing that it reminds us of, this song reminds us, is that there's nothing so wrong with the world that God's justice won't make right. There's nothing so wrong with the world that God's justice won't make right. That in this life or in the life to come, God will make all things right, all things new. And some of you wonder, can God make right relationships that have been hurt? Can God make right a life that has gone off course? Can God make right a mess that is my life? Advent says, yes, he can. Advent says, when God comes, God makes all things new. That there's nothing so broken, brothers and sisters, that God's justice cannot make right. And this is why we sing, because of mercy. This is why we sing, because of justice. This is why we wait for Jesus to come. Because when he comes, he's making all things new.
His mercies are new every morning. And there's no brokenness in this world that can withstand his justice when he makes all things right. This Jesus would come, live for 30 years, die on a cross for us, where on that cross mercy and justice converge, taking on our sins, offering us a new way forward where mercy and justice flow over and over again. And this is what we celebrate at Advent. We wait for the one to come who will make all things new, to mark our lives by mercy and to mark our lives with justice. Let's pray together. I wonder today, is your life marked by songs of mercy, songs of justice? In this first week of Advent, we are invited to sing with Mary, to sing from the deepest part of our being, that God's mercy runs deeper than our sin, that God's justice runs deeper than the world's brokenness. Think about your life for a moment. What's wrong with it? What's broken? What are the struggles that you are carrying? The wounds that can't seem to heal? In Advent, we wait. We wait for the coming of Jesus. Before we take communion, I want to invite you to, to offer your hearts to God in repentance. Repentance is a very simple way of saying, I'm turning to God. I'm moving away from my own self and my own will, my own agenda. And I'm saying, God, I'm turning to you. I want to give you a moment to offer your own repentance before the Lord. Where do you need forgiveness? Where do you need mercy? So take a few moments and then we'll pray a prayer of confession on the screen together. But where do you need mercy in your life? Just in the, in the silence of your own heart, ask God for it. Let's all stand together. Our custom at New Life on the first Sunday of the month is to take communion together, to receive it together. And so I want to invite the ushers to come forward, invite those to go to the tables. And as you take bread and dip it in a cup, go back to your seat and just, just hold it. Hold it before the Lord. Think about God's mercy and God's goodness to you. And then I'll come back up and I'll lead us to take it together. Let's pray this prayer of confession on the screen. And we confess it together because we are all of us in need of mercy. There's not one person in this room who doesn't need it. We all need the mercy of God. Let's pray this together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and our neighbor through our own fault, in thought, in word, in deed, in what we have done, in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Please come forward. I have traveled 
many moonless nights Cold and weary With a baby inside And I wonder what I've done Holy Father, you have come And chosen me now To carry your son I am waiting in a silent prayer. I am frightened by the Lord I bear in a world as cold as snow. Must I? Do you wonder as you watch my face if a wiser one should have had about your own life, we focus on the mercy of Jesus and reflect on the words of the Apostle Paul, who says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes as the people of God freely forgiven by the mercy of Jesus Christ let's all receive together
Amen. Let's have the prayer team come to my left. We close every gathering with prayer because it's a way that mercy comes our way. It's one of the ways that mercy comes when we position ourselves to receive. This is why Mary says, God remembers the humble, that those who receive mercy are those who recognize, I need it. I need it. And so we close with, with prayer because for some of you, you think your sin is too great for God. And we gather together to remember Jesus Christ was broken and bruised, takes our sin on himself, dies in our place, takes on the judgment of the world, the judgment of God on sin, and offers us pardon and mercy and forgiveness and freedom. One of the ways that we receive that is by praying for one another. And so maybe you came in here and you're harboring guilt and condemnation and shame. Don't walk out of here with that. Let someone pray for you. Let someone be a conduit of God's mercy in your life. And then for some of us, there are things that are just not right. Not right with our lives, not right with our families. We look at the world and we say things are not right with the world. And we wait for God's justice. We wait for God to make all things new and to take what's wrong and make it right in God's way. And maybe you're burdened by what's happening in your life. We want, we want to pray for you as well. So whether you need mercy, whether you're longing for justice, we want to pray for you and our prayer team will stay as long as we need to. As we close, I want to invite you to open your hands towards heaven to receive a blessing. This posture of receiving is us essentially saying, I need mercy. I need grace. I need forgiveness. I need God. And may this posture mark your life this week. I want to encourage you to read Mary's song this week that your life would be marked by songs of mercy and justice. <laughs> but with your hands and your hearts in a posture of receiving brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and fill you with peace. And may you walk out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit, singing songs of mercy, singing songs of justice as we wait for Jesus Christ to come. I bless you today in the strong, in the beautiful, in the merciful and just name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. amen. Grace and peace to you all.